Thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. We're very fortunate to have uh, Tant Mint Yu as our guest this evening. He's been a physical guest at UNU in Tokyo, and we had hoped to have him again this year, but we'll have to put that off until next year. Meanwhile, he uh, agreed to join us this evening. Um, for those of you who didn't have uh, an opportunity to look at his background, uh, it's a very rich background. He comes from one of Burma's most prominent families. Uh, his grandfather was the third secretary general of the United Nations, a very good one as time goes on and secretaries general get reappraised. There's a widespread view that uh, Utant did an excellent job in very contrary circumstances uh, at the height of the Cold War. Um, and Tant himself, when I first met him uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 years ago, was a brilliant young staffer in the UN Secretariat, having finished his PhD, I think, at Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was published eventually. And that thesis actually made clear something that remains true of all of his writing. He's a natural writer. Whatever he wants to conjure from the page to the reader somehow comes to life. So unlike 90%, at least, of the authors, whose prose stays inert on the page, his comes to life instantly. And since then, he has written once about the United Nations, a very good short book about the UN Secretariat, but otherwise he's written history. And so my first question for you, Tant, who lives in uh, Myanmar or Burma, both names are used now uh, today, is uh, our title, Does History Shape Destiny of Countries? Or are there other factors? Uh, and how do you feel about that proposition? You're muted, Tant, we can't hear you. Sorry, it's the hazards of, of, of Zoom these days, but thank you very much, David, for the very kind and, and, and generous introduction. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you and to, to join colleagues at, at UNU and, and everyone else who's here today um, in this discussion. I think your question is really, obviously for me as a historian, it's a really interesting one. And I, I guess my, my tentative answer is to say yes. And I think in the case of, of Burma or, or Myanmar, history is first and foremost the history of, of colonialism. Um, Myanmar, what is today Myanmar, was a collection of different kingdoms and polities throughout much of its history, the Irrawaddy Valley and its surrounding uplands. It was then brought together violently through three Anglo-Burmese wars by the British Indian Empire. It was created as a military occupation. It was created as a racial hierarchy. Over the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the political economy, the modern political economy of Burma, was born as a very exploitative political economy based on the export of primary commodities, rice, teak, and oil, and the importation of Indian labor uh, to fill new positions in that economy, both labor and also the professional classes as well. And the history of Myanmar or Burma since independence has been, in a way, a reaction to that history of colonialism. There was first a left-wing reaction to that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the Burmese way to socialism, which increasingly became an isolationist kind of um, socialism as well, cut off from the rest of the world. And we're living in many ways with that legacy. And I think if we ask the question of, you know, is history destiny? I guess in the end, I mean, it's up to the Burmese to break free of that colonial legacy in a way in which they haven't. Um, they haven't broken away from the ways in which colonialism defined people by race and ethnicity. Instead, they further rarefied the kind of ethnic categories that were first developed under British rule. And they haven't really set themselves uh, towards a, a new vision of what uh, a modern, developed 
Burma or Myanmar can be. And instead, I think they've been caught up in these conflicts that really go back to the 1940s around identity and ethnicity, uh, still a very exploitative, predatory political economy. And I think until the Burmese set themselves towards breaking free of that, I think uh, we're still going to be subsumed in this sort of cycle that really began uh, a long time ago during the colonial period in terms of Burma being an underdeveloped country and a country that's far from its potential. And Burma did break free fairly early in the decolonization movement. Uh, uh, another factor that shapes what countries wind up doing, of course, is geography. And one of your most gripping books was called Where China Meets India. Uh, and of course, China meets India in several places, but very much in Burma and through Burma. So I wanted to ask you also about these two regionally as well as globally very significant neighbors and how their interaction in uh, Burma and on Burma has shaped the country. I guess the thing is, you know, if we think about geography, um, it's a shifting geography, right? So I think the, the wrong way to think about it would be to think of the map as a very static thing. And if you look at the map today, you have Burma and you have, you have the Indian border right to the west and you have the Chinese border right to the east. But if you go back, not just not millennia, but even centuries, uh, India was much further away. And between uh, the Irrawaddy Valley kingdoms and in India, were many other smaller kingdoms and, and polities that are now part of the Indian Republic, but were independent until uh, the beginnings of, of, of British rule. But India, of course, had this enormous, or Indian civilization had this enormous impact on the civilizations of the Irrawaddy Valley from across the Bay of Bengal by sea, uh, via Buddhism, but also many other um, different influences in, in art, in architecture, in the realm of ideas, uh, politics as well. Um, but it was never uh, an empire in Burma. India was never seen as a strategic threat to Burma. There was no conquest of Burma from India until the British conquered uh, Burma from India in the 19th century. India's big influence on Burmese history since then has been what I mentioned before, this migration of millions of Indians of pe Indian people into Burma in the 19th and 20th century and then their subsequent exodus and expulsion in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, which left this enormous void because they had been a big part of setting up this colonial political economy uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. With China, you have a similar thing in the sense that the Chinese border is something new. You had many different kingdoms and polities in between what was China in the past and, and what, would, what Burma was or the Irrawaddy Valley kingdoms were in the past. And that Chinese frontier has moved, been moving steadily southwestward towards Burma, again, for millennia, the first Chinese trade mission that was looking for a way across Burma to, to India came through, I think it was in the second century uh, BC. So it's a very long standing kind of moving frontier. And now India and China are closer to each other than ever before, uh, because they are right around, around Burma. Um, and this dynamic of what happens to Burma in between these two giant and emerging superpowers of the 21st century is, of course, one of the biggest questions of our day, but it's an enormous question for the future of, of Burma as well. And I think central to that is this question of, can Burma move from being what has been traditionally a fairly isolated country in many ways, because the great kind of avenues and highways of the world always circumvented Burma. They either went uh, through Central Asia, the old Silk Road, uh, or through a maritime road uh, or maritime route uh, via today, via the Malacca Straits and what is today Singapore. And, and Burma was kind of this, 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 um, this, um, this gap in the, in the map of, 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 of the world before. And, if, and Burma kind of grew up in this kind of semi-isolation. And so if Burma can and wants to come out of that isolation and connect and, and be part of this, uh, of an Asia that's much more woven together and can play the role of being um, a hub within Asia, I think is a, it's a question for Asia, and of course, it's a, it's a central, almost existential question uh, for Burma going forward. And very central to that question will be the future of the bilateral relationship between India, Burma, and China, which is very good. Burma has good relations with both, but we're, I think, only at the beginning of the story of exactly how these three countries, these three civilizations will meet 
uh, across Burma over the rest of the 21st century. Now, at the moment, you're heading up an effort uh, to initiate a very serious uh, deep dive uh, economic study of prospects for the economic future of Burma. And we were chatting a bit about uh, my last visit to Burma, which was five years ago. And at the time, the capital Yangon was a real boom town. It was El Dorado. Every capitalist in Asia had set up shop. The, uh, the Japanese had never really left Yangon, even through the worst years of economic uh, uh, sort of despond. They were still there. China continued to be a big actor. India wanted part of the action. And so did the rest of the world. So I wanted to ask you how in the last five years that's been playing out in effect. I think, you know, when we think of Burma in the past 20, 25 years, we often think of the country in terms of the democracy struggle and, and especially the kind of contest between the generals and the national youth democracy led by Duan San Suu Kyi, who is now the state councillor. I think we need to frame this period as well as the period where Burmese socialism and its main opponent in the past, communism, died out completely and was replaced by a new capitalist system which was born in the late 1980s. And that was a capitalist system in Burma, which was particular, uh, particularly corrupt. It was particularly predatory. It was linked very much with illicit industries like the production and trafficking of narcotic drugs, uh, uh, an industry that UNODC today estimates it worth being 60 or $70 billion a year and tied intimately to China next door and the giant industrial revolution in China. But during that same period, Burma was under Western sanctions, which meant that it was cut off from not just Western, but global markets as well. When those sanctions ended in 2011, 12, because the country began to come out of military dictatorship and there was a rapprochement, at least uh, temporarily between Don San Suu Kyi and the ex-generals that were leading that reform process, sanctions were lifted and Western investors uh, reconnected with the country. Western investment came in as well as global investment as well in the investment from countries like Japan as well. So there was a sort of a mini boom or at least the atmosphere of a mini boom. And in some sectors like telecoms, for example, there was a real revolution. Several billion dollars from, from overseas was invested into telecoms. Burma went from a country where almost no one had a telephone to everyone having a mobile phone, 85% having smartphones and going from no internet practically to 4G internet within literally three or four years time. So there was enormous economic change but it was on top of this political economy uh, that was not only deeply corrupt, but deeply unfair, had produced a very unequal society as well. And I think simply liberalizing that political economy in the, in the 2010s or looking at sort of market reforms, but without really getting to grips with what kind of political economy it was, what kind of basic structural transformation might be necessary, I think needs to link as well to a much more long-term vision of what kind of developed country, first Myanmar or any country can be in the mid 21st century given climate change and everything else, given Myanmar's specific constraints like being next to China, which is also an opportunity uh, in many ways, given the interest in Myanmar of countries like Japan that also has tremendous potential to help drive Myanmar's um, economic development. But in the end, for Myanmar people themselves to think about what kind of country they want to be and to, and to reimagine development as not simply being about GDP growth and not even simply being about human development, but being about the fundamental transformation of a society into being an advanced economy, into being a developed economy. What that means in the mid 21st century, what that can mean for Myanmar, I think that discussion is not only important in itself because we have tens of millions of poor people we have this enormous climate emergency that's coming and we need the resources to be able to, to deal with it, but because I think it will give content to democratic institutions. Um, and without that, I think it's going to be very difficult both to transition properly to a genuine and meaningful democratic system, but I think also this is something or this discussion is essential 
if we're going to move from this sort of situation where we still have so many different insurgencies and militia and non-state armed groups in the country to something like uh, a genuine and sustainable peace in the country as well. Great, Tant. We're now going to turn to questions. And my colleague Sandeep and uh, my colleague Sandeep and Basilio will take over and channel uh, questions to you from the audience. And we'll speak again towards the end. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have a few questions. And the first one is from Iftekar Mahmoud, Assistant Professor of Eastern University in Bangladesh. And he is asking, Myanmar is managing to secure support in the UN Security Council of late. Is it because of its history or contemporary political choices that Myanmar has made? I think Myanmar is actually quite a divisive issue on the, on the UN Security Council in the sense that throughout the 1990s, but especially in the 2000s, the Western countries led by the US and the UK uh, sought to use the Security Council as an arena in which to uh, criticize um, the military dictatorship of the time uh, for human rights abuses, especially. Um, but it was prevented from doing so and, and uh, resolutions on the Security Council were blocked uh, by China in particular and by Russia as well, uh, supporting. So uh, it's been a divisive issue at the UN and the Security Council. And I suppose Myanmar's, or at least the old military dictatorship's closest friend uh, at the UN and on the Security Council had been China. Now that sort of geopolitics shifted after 2011 when there was this um, seemingly sort of sudden, but, but actually kind of, I think it was a, a longer uh, process that, that led up to it, a seemingly sudden sort of reform, uh, set of reforms uh, that led to the end of Western sanctions and this very sudden kind of embrace between Western governments and, and Myanmar leading to the visit of many Western heads of government and state, including President Obama at the time, uh, and that seemed to distance the relationship between Myanmar and China. But now, more recently, uh, with the Rohingya crisis, for example, where the issue of Myanmar has come up again on the Security Council, again, it's been China uh, first and foremost that has been providing diplomatic support to, to Myanmar. So in a way, it's a longstanding thing. Uh, and in its a way, it's, it's, a, it's a return after a hiatus of, of, of several years. Thank you. Since 2011, Burma has passed from a military regime to a quasi-democratic state. Um, employment uh, sectors seem to have changed from the tertiary to the secondary sector. Since the tertiary sector was the main uh, source of employment before, but now it's moving into this, what would be the effects of economic development on urbanization? And what should be prepared to keep pace with population growth in cities? This is from Ni Lin Mao from Tokyo of University and the Civil Department. I think one really interesting thing in, in Myanmar over the past many decades, maybe it's similar to some other countries, but, but it's, it's certainly the case in Myanmar, which is that uh, a lot of people have moved from, from the countryside to, to cities. Uh, land has been confiscated on a, on a massive uh, scale, both under the dictatorship, but even uh, more recently over this, over this past decade, or people have been displaced uh, from their land. Agricultural conditions have worsened in some parts of the country. In other parts of the country, agriculture has been mechanized, and so there's less of a need for labor. But that labor um, has led to some urbanization and some movement of people, poor people, too young, going looking for, for jobs, for example. But the vast bulk of people have actually moved from the countryside to the cities in other countries. And so you have about three or four million Myanmar workers now employed in Thailand, some in the services, but a lot in Thai industry. So you have a new Myanmar Burmese industrial class, but it's in another country. It's in Thailand, uh, to some extent in Malaysia and a couple of other uh, countries as well. But I think looking forward, I think if Myanmar follows the path of, of, of any other country towards uh, development and we see more industrialization uh, and more and a greater growth of both manufacturing and, and, and service sectors, we will of course see urbanization. I think this question of what the future of Myanmar cities is going to be is, is really uh, an urgent priority. It's an urgent priority because our number one city, Yangon, is on the coast and is particularly uh, susceptible to, um, uh, to the impact of, of climate change. Uh, but also because I think with this COVID pandemic, this is of course a time to reflect and think about you know, what a city should be and what a healthy and a happy city can be. Um, and I think I've, I've been leading an effort in, in, in Yangon to try to protect the agricultural, uh, the architectural heritage of the of the city, uh, 
and through that to get people to kind of think about urban planning issues and think about uh, what the future of cities overall should be and what people should want and what a livable city can be. So I think it's an incredibly uh, important issue going forward. But I think you know, maybe to answer the question a little more directly, I think all of this also has to be part and parcel of an overall plan for development, an overall vision for development, for industrialization uh, that needs to be uh, both thought about, but also debated much more than it is currently uh, within the country. Thank you. Shruti Junjunwala, a student from India, is asking, how do you think developing regions apart from China and India, such as ASEAN, play out in the development scenario? Well, I think within ASEAN, you have, you have you know, the, the biggest kind of variation you can possibly imagine. And in a way, it's perhaps one of the things that make ASEAN quite unique. I mean, you can, you can travel from a place like Singapore, which is one of the most advanced cities in the world with one of the highest standards of living and, and highest per capita GDP. And literally within an hour's flight, you could be uh, in somewhere in, in Myanmar, uh, where there has been no development for, for 100 years. Uh, and where civil war is still raging and, and people are living hand to mouth on day-to-day on, on -day wages. And so you have this enormous variation. So I think where ASEAN as a, as a, as a collective of, of, of 10 countries goes, I think, I guess is anyone's guess, but I think, I think much will depend on, on the trajectory of, of each and every one of these countries. And I think, you know, with, with COVID and, and with the post-pandemic world, the big question for everyone is going to be, what that world will look like in terms of uh, changes to global supply chains, uh, the extent to which China is able to power out of this uh, economic downturn more quickly uh, than others, uh, the kinds of policies that the rest of the country, more protectionist or not, uh, will begin to, to take. And I think within Southeast Asia, the ability of each of these countries, the flexibility of each of these countries, the ability of each of these countries to really think about these things and strategically plan uh, for the future. And my, my fear is that the countries that are already rich will be able to do that relatively well. The countries that are poor, like Myanmar, won't have that capacity to, to strategize in an environment in which strategic thinking is going to be even more important than 10 or 20 years ago. Thank you. Uh, we have a student, uh, Anurag Agarwal in Tokyo, is asking, Aung San Suu Kyi has won the Nobel Peace Prize for standing up for universal human rights. However, her leadership has now been defined by the Rohingya crisis and several colonial era-like laws. Do you think the democratic transition has stalled from Myanmar? I think it, you know, we need to think about where the democratic transition began. And I think this is where a lot of misperceptions have begun as well. The constitution that we have now is not a democratic constitution. The constitution that we have now was specifically designed with democratic uh, components like a partially elected parliament that then decides on who the president of the country is going to be. But it was designed by the army in the 1990s as the system to which they felt comfortable in handing over power from a pure military dictatorship. This is something that the army had wanted since the 1990s. It was uh, the democratic opposition at the time led by Duan San Suu Kyi, as well as many Western governments that said, it is not good enough, but they went ahead and did it anyway in 2010. And that led to this kind of hybrid constitution that we have today. But that hybrid constitution that we have today or that setup, what was added onto that in 2011, 2012 was a degree of political freedom that no one had anticipated, the release of political free, uh, prisoners, uh, the ending of media censorship, uh, freedom of association, for example, that convinced many Western governments and I think Dohan Sasuji herself, that perhaps this was the first step towards a transition to something different. But that's something different hasn't happened yet. But I would say, and we're going into elections in a couple of weeks time, that despite all the problems, and this will be a deeply flawed election, it's still a light years ahead of anything we could have imagined just 10 years ago. So given where Burma is, uh, as a country still mired in, in armed conflict, this poor, I think having elections, having a multi-party system, uh, having this degree of political freedom is still a big, um, is still a big uh, step up from where we were before. The problem is that these democratic institutions are not showing themselves uh, capable of addressing, let alone solving the deep-seated issues that, that, that we've been talking about. And with the Rohingya uh, crisis in particular, uh, 
it's not necessarily a deep seated issue in the sense that it's not something that's been around for, for centuries. It's, it's, the, it's come around the dynamic of the past few decades and, and the violence of the past decade in, in particular, but it's linked to a, a much broader set of issues around identity as well as dictatorship, as well as the kind of predatory political economy that I've been talking about. And I, and I think unless we have a, a nationwide solution to all of these problems, it's going to be very difficult to find uh, specific uh, solutions to specific uh, issues of, of, of conflict in the country. I think with Dawn San Suu Kyi herself, you know, I think it's only 10 or 20 years from now that we look back and we see exactly what political historic juncture we're at and where things go. Uh, whether we actually su successfully transition uh, to something that's much more of a genuine democracy or not. And we look at the specific role that, that she and, and others have taken at this incredibly important time in the country's history, what role they've actually had in, in, in shaping that future. This may be our second to the last question, um, but it sounds like the perfect timing to ask from Clara Feng from Singapore. Thanking you for your presentation and asking, in spite or perhaps of the cancellation of elections in a number of townships in various states, the NLD is expected to maintain their stronghold in Burman majority regions for the upcoming elections. What are the lessons that the NLD can take from their lackluster performance of their current first term? How do you see this in the context of Burma's history? It's interesting because you know the criticisms of, of, the, of the present government have come from completely different directions. So I think in the West, the main criticism has been almost exclusive, or the, the only criticism really has been around the Rohingya, the, her handling and the government's handling of the Rohingya crisis and, and violence and, and, and refugee exodus in, in, in 2017. Within the country, uh, there are many businessmen who are disappointed with the handling of the economy. Uh, there are civil society and human rights activists that are, that are worried and concerned about the government's handling of, of political freedom uh, within, within the country. But the thing is that you know, politics in Myanmar is not about policy. There are very weak opposition parties, uh, ethnic minority peoples who will want to or may want to vote for ethnic minority parties, either may be prevented from doing so because of fighting within the country and, and the cancellation or suspension of elections in, in many of these constituencies, but also because we have a first past post electoral system and very demographically mixed townships, ethnic minority parties may not do well, even if they have a degree of, of, of popular support within their own uh, communities. But I was gonna say that politics is, is, is primarily not about policies, but about personalities and who you trust. And the ethnic Burmese speaking Buddhist majority is the electoral majority in the country. And for them, they still trust Doan San Suu Kyi and they trust and believe in her story as the person that they believe stood up against the military dictatorship over those two decades. and that. I think is going to carry her through this election. Now, what happens after the election over the coming years, when I think so many different problems are going to come together, economic, the pandemic, uh, the continued armed conflicts, the weakness of, of many institutions in the country, I think we are being set up for uh, an enormous set of challenges on top of which will be climate change. Um, and we're only gonna have to hope that somehow Myanmar's incipient democratic institutions are going to be able to cope uh, with the big challenges to come. I'd like to end it on a positive note um, from Saint Nin Mon, a student from KU University in economics. She asks, what is your advice to future generations of young Myanmar students? I think, I think the young, I'm incredibly impressed by young Myanmar uh, people, by young, I mean, in their 20s, early 30s. It's the first generation that's grown up in a much less isolated country. Uh, it's the first generation that at least for some, they've had the education or the, pri uh, the, the, the privilege of, of accessing a good education within the country or, or outside the country. I really think the future is in their hands. I would say their advice, my advice to them would be don't listen to, to older people. And I think for you know, the, 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 the young people today, they have to decide what kind of country they want and they have to set about um, making it happen. And I, I really think there's gonna be a, a generational shift, not just the obvious one in terms of people who are in their 70s and 80s, who are in government, um, uh, uh, not being in government in, in the future, but even people in their 50s and 60s. I think it's, it's, it's for, for the young people today who really, who've grown up in the internet age, who've grown up with new technologies, who've grown up in this less isolated, more connected world. I think they have to decide what future they want. And, and I think whatever they decide, it's possible. Burma is a country with 
tremendous potential. It just has to break free as we, you know, going back to, to David's first question, I mean, break free of this history, break free of this history of colonialism, the colonialism of, of colonization of the, of the mind itself around these issues of ethnicity. And I think anything is, is, is possible. And, and, but I think they have to do it and they have to, and of course they're gonna do it in a, in a world that's gonna be much more constrained by climate change. So I think you have to think about that as well. But I think to end on an optimistic note, I think if they want to, um, and they, they show the will and are able to mobilize collectively around a future, I think anything is, is possible uh, in Myanmar going forward. Well, Tan, thank you so much. You've uh, packed a huge amount into, you know, very little time. And I think our audience, and I noticed we lost nobody during the uh, intervention, uh, uh, the audience will be extremely grateful to you because you covered a huge amount of ground. You did so very frankly. You made complex issues seem accessible. We all go away feeling smarter. What could be nicer uh, on an evening in Tokyo for me? So thank you very much. We'll hope to have you and Sophia, your partner, back with us again in Japan very soon. And meanwhile, all good wishes for your important economic work on the future of uh, Burma. I'm a big believer in your project. Thank you. Thank you very much, David.